Now let us pay preliminary homage to the Buddha. Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One.
a salutation to the Triple Gem, page 21. Andhamayang ratnathaya panamagatha yo deva samvega barikitana patanja panamase. Now let us chant our salutation to the Triple Gem and the passage of encouragement. Vurnta tusurnta karuna mahanawa Vurnta absolutely pure with ocean-like compassion Yurchanda surna bharanyana Possessing the clear sight of wisdom Loka sabhapo pakile sakadako, destroyer of worldly self corruption, Wandami Buddha Kahamadari Nadang, devotedly in need that Buddha I revere, Tamo Pagimo, we are not sad to know. The teaching of the Lord like a lamp. Yoma Gamma Gamma Dabi Dabi Nako. Illuminating the path and its fruit, the deathless. Lotu Daro Yo Chakata Dadi Pano. That which is beyond the conditioned world. Vandami Dhamma Gahamma Jari Nadang Devotedly indeed that Dhamma I revere Sangho Sukhe Dhamma Yadike the Sanyito The Sangha, the most fertile ground for cultivation Yogita Sandor Sukhantanu Bodhako Those who have realized peace Awakened after the accomplished one Lola Pahino Ario Sumeda So Noble and wise all longing abandoned Vandami Sangha Nama Dari Nadang Devotedly indeed that Sangha I revere Ichewa Mekanda Vipujanaya Kang This salutation should be made Vandutayang Vandayana Bhi Sangha Tang To that which is worthy Punyang Mayayang Mamasa Bhubhadrava Through the power of such good action Mahonju Veda Sabhavasitya May all obstacles disappear Idhata Tagadoru Keumano Arahan Samasam Buddha one who knows things as they are has come into this world and he is an arahant, a perfectly awakened being. Namo jade zidoniyaniko upasamiko parinibhaniko sambo dagami sukhadabhavedito Purifying the way leading out of delusion, calming and directing to perfect peace, and leading to enlightenment. This way he has made known. Mayang Tang Dhammang Sutawa Ewang Janama. Having heard the teaching, we know this. Chadi Pitura. Birth is Dukkha, Jarapi Dukkha, Aging is Dukkha, Maranam Pi Dukkha, and Death is Dukkha, Sokha Paridewa Dukkha, Domana Subhaya Sapi Dukkha, 
Sada lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, dukkha. Arpe ye hisam payoko dukkha. Association with the dislike is dukkha. Tie hi vipayoko dukkha. Separation from the life is dukkha. Yam pi chang nalapatitam pi dukkhang. Not attaining one's wishes is dukkha. Sanghi te na panchu padhanakanda dukkha. In brief, the five focuses of the grasping mind are dukkha. Sayati tang. These are as follows. Rupa Tanakando, identification with the body. Vedanupa Tanakando, identification with feeling. Sanyupa Tanakando, identification with perception. Sangarupa Tanakando, Identification with mental formations. <coughs> Vinyanupadhana kando. Identification with consciousness. Yesang parinyayam. For the complete understanding of this. Dharamano so bhagava. The blessed one in his lifetime. Ewan Bhagulang Savake Vinedi frequently instructed his disciples in just this way. Ewan Bhagachapanatsa Bhagavato Savake Suvanasasane Bhagula Bhavadati. In addition, he further instructed Rupangani Chang. The body is impermanent. Vedana anicca. Feeling is impermanent. Sanya anicca. Perception is impermanent. Sangara anicca. Mental formations are impermanent. Vinyana anicca. Consciousness is impermanent. Rupanganata, the body is not self. Vedanata, feeling is not self. Sanyanata, perception is not self. Sangaranata, mental formations are not self. Vinyanaganata, consciousness is not self. Sabe Sankaranicha, all conditions are impermanent. Sabe Tamanatati, there is no self in a created or the uncreated. Te Mayang, all of us, Ardinamachadiya Jaramaranena. Abound by birth, aging, and death. So, ke hi pari te we hi du ke hi tom and se hi upaya se hi. By sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Du ko ni na du ka pari ta. Mal by du ka and obstructed by du ka. Let us all aspire to complete freedom from suffering. Jira parini bhutam pitang bhagavanda saranangata. The Blessed One, Dulaga, Ordning, Bhavini, Padars, our refuge, Dhamma, Sangha, so to our the Dhamma and the Sangha, Tatsa, Bhagavato, Sasana, Yatasati, Yatabala, 
Manasi karoma anupati pachama. Attentively we follow the pathway of the Blessed One. With all of our mindfulness and strength, sasano pati pati. May then the cultivation of this practice, imat sakhe walat sadruka kandat sahantakiriya sangvatatu. Lead us to the end of every kind of suffering.
noticing the sound of silence as a background and the sound of the birds. You notice that they don't, you don't have to focus. You know, one doesn't cancel out the other. So that just noticing this, that sound of silence is like background, so it includes the, any sound that arises. It's like space, visual space. It includes everything in the space that we see. If you just if you pay attention to the space, it doesn't destroy the things in the space, but gives perspective on the conditions and the things in the space. The same with sound of silence; it doesn't destroy any other sound, but. gives perspective on the, what the arising, ceasing of sounds that uh, are kind of ordinary sounds. Sound as we tend to recognize it begins and ceases. It has a birth and a death. Sound of silence has this continuity. It flows. It's a flowing like a thread or a stream. So these, these words, thread and stream, are oftentimes used to convey the deathless or the path. Now the breath arises and ceases. So like Anapanasati, when you're concentrating on the breath, it stops the thought process because your attention is on a, something else than thinking. So you, you can uh, sustain awareness on the inhalation, exhalation of your breathing. But breathing itself, uh, you know, just in this moment now, there's inhalation conditions and exhalation. So the breath then can also be in the context of the sound of silence. You know, as you recognize and rest in this resonating vibration, it helps to stop the the, the uh, wandering mind. As you stay with the breath, I found anapanasati much more easy with the sound of silence as a background.
a question about this. This because uh, there can be different kind of background sounds. So the general instruction is always to aim for the, the highest pitch block. So this, what I when I listen to sound silence, I'm listening to kind of a kind of electrical scintillating, I don't, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's quite high pitch. One can, can see it as a kind of buzz, but buzz is not very flattering to it. Hum, it's a kind of humming sound, whispering. But anyway, whatever it is, it it uh, it once you detect it, then it's quite useful towards uh, using as a as something to focus on, to to find in the present, in which gives. Uh, our reflective capacities, uh, their sharpest ability, their most effectiveness is because it, it stops the thinking, the rationalizing, the doubting intellect. And you, you have this continuity of awareness where then thought can be much more instrumental than just uh, obsessive or, uh, you know, it takes over. When you think of, you can question, you can miss what is it, you know. Who's listening? All these koans and conundrums that we can think of, questions, uh, then can be quite useful you know, just to, to contemplate not to define anymore. We're not into definition, trying to pin everything down like a butterfly on the wall. You can leave, leave things be as they are and reflect. Like in the ignorance, we want, to, we want everything defined. We want to know through concepts. Tell me what's right. Tell me what's wrong. What should I do next? <clears throat> Define everything for me. <clears throat> so through definition, then we feel we know something because it, we find the definition in the in the dictionary, or the the teacher tells us. Uh, well, Ajahn Chah told me that <laughs> that must be true. But uh, a lot of Ajahn, Ch Ajahn Chah's style was always this Maina style, which is uncertain. You know, it's always bringing us to this level of uncertainty rather than, than giving neat little package answers to every question. So this is, a, you know, this, this not knowing, knowing of not knowing puts into context this desire to know things through, through conceiving them, through defining them. So like wanting to know who you are, wh what is my real self? Uh, I like to know who I really am. What is my true nature? And so for these people get very confused because they, if they, when, especially when the personality is being investigate it, because suddenly all the assumptions and ideas and that that you hold to as yourself start become start becoming meaningless. 
and we we can some people find that very distressing because it you know even if you know they, they, I'm an alcoholic or I'm at least you know you've got some identity <laughs> so, you know, a man always come up and say I'm an alcoholic but I haven't had a drink for 10 years this is the, is the way he presented himself or I'm a schizophrenic or whatever <laughs> Some people's identities are, you know, well, at least they have some, something to to define themselves. But is that necessary? Are we anything at all? You know, do we do we need if we define ourselves as I'm the I'm my body? This is what all I am, or I'm a Theravadan Buddhist, uh, Orthodox. Theravada, <laughs> or I'm an American patriot. <laughs> These ones scare me. I'm not prone to them. But it, this, uh, you know, like even this, this emptiness is not even Buddhist. So it's, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, that uh, because Buddhism, Buddha is another word, is another convention. And so you're you're not claiming this, uh, you know, I am or or defining it or using any convention to to uh, contain it. It's outside the conventional realm, where the convention that we use can be seen in perspective. There, there are skillful means, expedient means, <coughs> but in the end, we, you know, it's n we need to let go of even the convention, because even attaching and identifying with the finest and best conventions is still bondage to death, to the limited. So like these are like the signs, like the Buddha Dhamma pointing at the deathless. <coughs> so you don't grasp a sign, you know, otherwise you'll never see where it's pointing to. You look to where it's pointing. So looking then, observing, knowing, Rather than than getting the right spelling and 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 having a certain conventional sign that you think any other sign any other pointers are wrong, and we can get sectarian, you know. When but when you look at when you think of the sign, if they're pointing at the deathless, then that's that's all that's necessary. It's not not quibble about the convention.
Now, this sound of silence also is very useful in uh, walking meditation because uh, it stops the wandering mind. And if you, get, you establish the, the walking path, and then, then you walk back and forth with the sound of silence, it stops the mind wandering out into other things. So I'd stand at one end of the walking path and listen to the sound of silence and then start walking to the other end, just to sustaining that attention till I get to the to the end of the path and then the stopping, turning, standing in the with the stillness of the sound of silence. I found it, it helped. It, it gave perspective on, on the uh, movements of the body. So like the, from sitting to standing to walking to lying down. Then lying down, when like it, going to sleep at night, lying down in the bed, I wear the posture, you know, consciously uh, recognize the posture of lying, usually lie on my side, and then uh, the sound of silence. Stops the, the activity of the mind, and just being with the sensations of the body and the, and the sound of silence, stillness of the mind. <coughs> Then waking up, I said, where is the sound of silence? I thought, no, you know, this is my, so I use this always to, to uh, as a focus for falling asleep, waking up. Then applying it to kind of very ordinary, see what happens like uh, when you're brushing your teeth. Or putting on your clothes, or whatever you know. So that that it, it's a way of of accessing this this kind of awareness, in which what you're doing is in that context. So you're not just it isn't perfunctory anymore. You're not just brushing your teeth and just in order to get it done and and uh, get on to the next thing. Uh, like uh, this is how I generally brush my teeth if I don't. <laughs> something you've got to do so you can get on to the next thing or, you know, put on my robe so I can get over to the meditation hall where this is, this is you know, begins to put into perspective this kind of compulsiveness of activity, always aiming for the next thing. You know, nothing is, is accepted for what it is, but it's, Things that, like brushing the teeth, putting on the robe, are done so I can get on to the really important thing, like getting over to the meditation hall. So, so much of daily life is, is kind of perfunctory, habitual, uh, not noticed. Uh, just the way we've learned how to to operate in our lives. So much of our life is not noticed, is never conscious, recognized, it's just habitual. So this is a way of, of, of breaking out of just habitual perfunctory activities. So that quite ordinary things, condition, you know, quite ordinary activities are part of the path, you know, the path, the deathless, the path of liberation, you know, the, the, just the movement of the body, the breathing, the, just the ordinary things we do in daily life, eating food or brushing our teeth, shaving or putting on our clothes, <laughs> taking them off or bathing or whatever is, is, is then, you know, we see it as, as integrating this awareness so that we lose this divisive kind of attitude of meditation is sitting on a retreat 
And when you're not sitting on a retreat, you're not really meditating. That the real practice is here, sitting on a mat. And that's how you hear meditation being talked about. You go to Burma to sit. You go to Sri Lanka and sit. And this must sound very strange to ordinary people. (laughs) (laughs) Can't you just sit in California? (laughs) 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 You can sit anywhere, really. But sitting is, is, uh, you know, is uh, oftentimes uh, the, the definition of meditation. How many hours do you sit? And, and so this is, defines our, you know, how good a meditator we are. <coughs> so this is because uh, we do, we, we like the concentration practice, like getting very tranquil and concentrated. So that's much more easy to do when you're sitting in a quiet place. In a, in a monastery, in a meditation center, in a meditation hall, uh, where you can sit and concentrate. And then the concentration is, is very pleasing. I mean, you get some odd concentrated states. It's, it's quite addictive. And uh, anything pleasurable is addictive. Happiness is addictive. We've become happiness junkies. We've become <laughs> addicted to concentration. And so that when we're not in that state of concentration, then we, we get, you know, we think, oh, this terrible life, this stressful existence in San Francisco. And uh, it's, uh, you know, how can, uh, London, how can you, you know, if you've got to, Right on the underground, London Underground, you can't really be mindful, it's so chaotic, so many people, we grumble. But I find, uh, you know, I quite enjoy the London Underground. Because I still can be in the stillness while being in a crowded train that's zooming along under the city of London. No abstraction. But if I, if I still have this, you know, this d- divided sense that meditation is at Amravati in the temple, then the London Underground is, you know, just a, you have to put up with it. You know, you've got to use it, I guess, and bear with the stress and stupidity of modern society and get into a very negative uh, uh, state where, where much of your life is... Uh, is not, you know, it's, it's, you're not using, you're not learning, you're merely becoming addicted to a special situation, special condition. So you see what I mean? This, this, the stopping, the thinking process is, is divisive. That's its function. Thinking, that's what it's for. <clears throat> so it's not a unitive function. To try to think creates division. You know, being caught, attachment to thinking, it, it always divides everything. You notice, and that's its purpose. There's nothing wrong with thinking, but you've got to know, understand it as a tool to use, not an end in itself. And that as long as you're you're kind of a, a victim of your thoughts, attached to your thinking, and and unaware and and of of what you of this attachment, then you're always going to feel lonely separate, incomplete. There's always going to be something wrong, either with you or 
the people you're with or the place you're in. It's critical, you know, no, this is, this is bigger than that. This is important, this is trivial. This is right and that's wrong. Now what is that? This is called dualism. So, so recognizing the thinking, uh, thinking goes, you have one thought moment at a time. You can't think two thoughts at the same moment. Obvious, isn't it? You think I and am. You can't think I am at the same moment. So that's time bound, isn't it? It's linear. You have one thought that connects to the next thought that connects to the next one. So that it, when you're attached to thinking, then you're in that linear process, the time, the 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 time bound conditioned state. And then good, you know, the, the questions uh, say, uh, if God is good, how can there be evil? You used to ask, you know, the priest. If God created everything, why did he create evil? And they say, well, he... Uh, we are the ones that create the evil. <laughs> <laughs> But he created me, didn't he? <laughs> Why didn't he create me so that I wouldn't have any evil tendencies? <laughs> well, he wants you to have free choice. Free choice between good and evil? That's not very nice. Because that, when when God is good, then then it's that's dualism again. You know, goodness is is uh, and badness. If you you get God, you get the devil. You get heaven. You get hell. And that's just uh, that's the the way the mind works on that level of thinking. And and it and it, so it's divided. You know, heaven is not hell. They're two separate. They've been hopefully very far apart. <laughs> Heaven's up there, hell's down below. But then in, in, uh, with awareness, you're recognizing unity, oneness, universality. And these words, universe, unity, oneness, wholeness. You know, where the oneness of this moment, when you try to figure it out, you're divided all the time. Or, you know, when you think of yourself as a person, you're always separating. You're always obviously not, you know, you don't see oneness with anything else. You only see separation. I'm different from you. You're not like I am. And that, that's the thinking process. But in, uh, with the awareness then, it's unitive. So this is, what is oneness in this moment is when I, when I, when I stop clinging to the thought, any thinking, in this stillness, this sound of silence, but I'm, I'm giving, giving up the concept of oneness. I'm being this, you know, so I'm not kind of <coughs> trying to define this as oneness, but pointing to the reality of oneness or wholeness. So timelessness, uh, if you can become aware of, like in developing a reflection on sound of silence is just like you forget the time the concepts of time don't arise or you're not you know you're not you're not thinking in terms of time time is thinking and time you know uh, it, it, that's time is always about thinking so like tomorrow and 
the next hour, the schedule, and all this is, is just about thinking, and it's thinking about yesterday or tomorrow. But I've known it like in sitting in a uh, temple at Amravati, timeless, like an hour, just, I don't know, it's just like nothing. But I think, I've got to sit for an hour and be aware for an hour. I, tomato, got to practice and sit for an hour and then I sit down and I, and I said, what time is it? It's <laughs> <laughs> then I notice that an hour can be in like an eternity. I'm waiting for the hour to end. I keep looking at the clock. Five minutes <laughs> waiting for the bell to ring is, is excruciating sometimes, isn't it? When's he going to ring the bell? (laughs) 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 I used to get paranoid. I think that that head monk, he's he's just trying to torture me. (laughs) (laughs) He's a a sadistic. So one can spin off into all kinds of, you know, uh, time-bound conditions and self-attitude through thinking alone, isn't it? So this is where, the, to transcend the thinking process, this isn't smothering or denying thought or an attack on thinking, uh, but it's putting thinking in, in, the, in, in where it belongs as a function and, and a tool to use rather than a position we take. So right and wrong, you know, what's right and what's wrong, and various people have various opinions. So you have Sangha meetings, and uh, you have the Orthodox, the ones that call themselves Orthodox Theravada, protecting the purity of Theravada tradition, and they've got strong views about what Theravada is and how you mustn't mix it with Mahayana or any, like, Kuan Yin or that kind of stuff. (laughs) Pure Pali Canon uh, orthodoxy, and that's an opinion, isn't it, to all that Pali Canon orthodox Theravada Mahayana. These are, this is language. Their function is to divide and separate. That's what, that's what it does. You know, nothing wrong with it, but it, to recognize that, that if, you know, if my opinion, I feel my opinion's right, my opinion is an opinion. You know, so it's, and, and, and if I'm convinced my opinion is right, but it's still a word, a thought, a concept, isn't it? And even... I'm right is a concept again that I'm creating. I'm orthodox. I don't know about, I think you're new age. (laughs) That means totally untrustworthy (laughs) to an orthodox Theravadan, isn't it? You want to put anyone down, you say new age. (laughs) I mean, you know, they're totally unbelievable and suspect. (laughs) Any, they'll do anything. So this is a this is the this is how the you know concepts work and prejudices you know we have prejudices and biases that that we support and that's always with language and rationalization and so forth. But in when now say on this retreat developing this intuitive awareness in which it's not a denial of of thought or a criticism, but uh, a liberating, uh, a liberation from the limitation of thinking. In which then the thinking process is much more, can be used more skillfully rather than, than just as a club and a criticism and a, you know, a tool for 
divide the, uh, for endless division. So in, in my own mind, you know, uh, I am this person, I'm Arjun Sumedho, I'm like, this is, this, this separates me from everything else. This defines the conditions that I'm attached to. How I see myself, my personality, my importance or lack of importance or whatever, then this is, this uh, on a conventional level, is, there's nothing wrong with it, you know, it's not, I shouldn't do this, but it, I know it for what it is. It's convention. They call uh, samuti sacha or conventional reality. And paramatta sacha, paramatta is the ultimate reality. So in this awareness practice, then you're you're recognizing, realizing ultimate or paramatta satcha, in which the conventional realities are then seen and, and their expedient means, their ways of doing things, ways of thinking, but they're not self anymore. We're not, we're not bound in that mortal state and limitation of conventional reality. We'll uh, finish with the uh, Reflections on Sharing Blessings in Pali. That's page 26. Antamayang utita nati tanakata yo banama se Imina punya kamena Umajaya gunudara Suryo Chandi Maharaja Gunawanda Narabija Brahma Mara Jainda Jaroka Bala Jadevata Yamomita Manusa Jamajata Verika P. 